most important thing today's world is to build an audience. Because mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, if you build an audience and they trust you and they follow you, then you will find a way to do business you know, with that audience at some point in the future by offering them something of value. And the best way to figure that out is to actually listen to your audience and see what they're asking you for time and time again related to your subject matter expertise. So we were, uh, as I mentioned, the email comes out. Some of the stuff I kind of want to talk with you about is I think you're a perfect example of somebody that went kind of from old school to new school and made a really nice transition and you get a good balanced lifestyle for yourself. You enjoy what you're doing. So I thought, you know, there's a lot of other people, not necessarily in the financial field, but in, in any kind of field that would probably love to copy what you did. And so you started out totally old school, right? You were, you were, um, the actuary is your background or is the, yeah. uh, yeah. So, Tell me about yeah. that again. You were, you were just a, just a geek or what was that? What was yeah, that? basically. Yeah. So, um, let's see. So I followed kind of in my family's footsteps. My dad was an actuary. And, uh, and so out of college, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I got a job as kind of a, you know, a consultant, you know, you always kind of get a job as a consultant out of college and then they, they figure out how to train you on the job to figure out whatever you're going to do. It ended up being pension consulting. Okay. So an actuarial, you know, field where you're trying to predict the future payouts for retirees and things like that. And so I ended up coming back and joining my dad's company, uh, which is long-term care insurance. And, you know, I was going to do like a rotation where I could learn all the different areas of the company, you know, kind of learn the insurance business that way. And I started off in the actual department and I never left. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I started off, you know, pricing investments. I managed the $3 billion uh, investment portfolio for the reinsurance company. And that was kind of my background on the actuarial side. And like as new needs cropped up in the company, I kind of raised my hand and, and was the pioneer in developing you know, out certain areas of the company. So one of the areas was to get a new insurance carrier, an insurance company into the long-term care space. And so I launched our business development department, which formerly had been really my dad's purview as the CEO. You know, he was setting up all the relationships and I expanded that out. So I began to go to the conferences. I met with all the Fortune 500 company executives and try to figure out, you know, where long-term care fit in their portfolio of insurance products. And through that process, uh, we ended up finding about three or four new carriers that wanted to offer a long-term care product in partnership with my dad's company. And um, we ended up selecting one of those four at the end of the day, because, you know, doing a new long-term care product launch is a major, you know, investment in time and resources. And, um, and so in that process, uh, the company we worked with uh, did not have as large of a brokerage presence uh, with the independent agents, but we had many relationships with other carriers over the past 30 years. And so they said, why don't you do the sales and the marketing? Typically the insurance company you know, manages their own sales and marketing, but in this case, they wanted us to do it. And so of course, this is our first time as a company doing sales and marketing for the insurance company. So again, I raised my hand, I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try that out. <laughs> Um, they said, basically, all you'll need to do, Mark, is you'll need to train the agents on how the product works. And I, I had priced and developed the product. So I was pretty well situated to explain to them, you know, why we designed the product the way we did. And they said, yeah, we'll probably get about 10 large, they call them BGAs or IMOs, you know, large brokerage agencies. Mm -hmm. And they're going to, you know, bring that message out to the field and, and they'll figure out where the product fits in their portfolio. So uh, we, you know, I, I set it up, I, I networked with all the agencies and all the long-term care specialists, and I built this marketing list of people that we could do an announcement to about the new product launch, you know, basically from scratch launching a new product, and uh, ended up getting 200 BGAs that wanted to sign up in the first month, you know, large agencies. I was like, well, I was, I was staffed, which was just me, to onboard 10, and now I have 200. What do I do, right? And so from that point on, I had to figure out how do you launch a major product without a wholesale team? You know, normally you have these wholesalers around the country, you know, that are launching the product kind of old school, like you said. Well, I have to do it all web-based because there's no way that I'm going to travel around the country hmm. with all these firms face-to-face, -face, the, the traditional way. And so I ended up building a virtual marketing program and sales and training and ended up launching a webinar series to help, you know, help agents offer long-term care more effectively. And so from there on out, you know, figuring out how to do a major product with a small staff ended up becoming something that I became skilled at, um, mm -hmm. having to do it myself. 
And through that process, I learned what the major issue with agents in long-term care is, is they're not great marketers. They're great salespeople. You know, face-to-face -face when they're in front of a client, they understand, they're very mission-based, they understand why clients need long-term care insurance and they're able to convince clients that it's a good, it's a good planning solution. But getting that clients to the table, they were, they were reporting back to me, I'm struggling to get meetings set up. And most of them were doing, you know, face-to-face -face meetings and, uh, you know, they were kind of grinding it out the old school way. So, you know, eventually we grew the product enough where the company decided that they wanted to invest a lot of resources to build their own wholesale team. They made it a tier one product, a great success story, you know, that we were able to launch a long-term care product with them. And they said, well, why don't we transition this back to the home office? And then I could actually launch my own company to do consumer marketing to help the agents, which is really where I thought I could make a difference in getting more people the long-term care plans. And that's where Buddy INS started. And I just started that a few months ago, but pretty much using the same formula that I used for launching the insurance company product, I'm using for helping the agents launch their marketing to their existing relationships, you know, mm. for the most part. They, they already have been in this business for a long time. They have a lot of great relationships, but they're not using digital marketing and figuring out how to stay in front of those folks, build a system so that people coming in the door, you know, those, those uh, prospects can be handled the right way and a good client experience. So we're building the whole technology platform for them to be, you know, elevated uh, in front of their own clients. And that's what Buddy INS is I'll right now. That, you know, my journey started a little bit earlier with the virtual stuff. I'll tell you that story too, if you'd like. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's important, I think, to the whole conversation of what we're, what we're talking yeah. about. So yeah, definitely. So back in uh, 2011, I went to an actuarial conference. I, I had just got in my fellowship, you know, as an actuary. And uh, they asked me to speak last minute at a conference in Chicago. I'm from Southern California. And so I kind of was very nervous about it. You know, I'm not great, you know, public speaking, you know, like most people, you know, you have to practice that for a long time. And so I went, went there, I was pretty nervous. After I was done with the session, I was so relieved that I went to the cocktail hour afterwards. And it turns out I ended up meeting my future wife there at the cocktail hour. She's an actuary, but she's from the East Coast. And so we met for like 24 hours, you know, we kind of hit it off and we went back to our respective cities and we said, well, how are we going to stay in touch? And so we ended up Skyping for the next five months video like this in 2011. Okay. And so I, I said, well, I, I really don't know if this is going to be the real deal. I have to figure this out. And I think the only way for me to do that is to move out to Washington, D.C. And, and kind of be closer to her geographically. So I went to my boss. I said, can I telecommute from Los Angeles? And he was graciously allowed me to do that. So I lived in DC and I traveled back to LA every month, but almost all the time I spent on video, I had to them install a video camera in the conference room. And so I got to get used to being on camera like this because mm. I was remote. And I said to my boss, I'll be back in two years. I'll either be single or I'll be married. I don't know which yet, but <laughs> that's my commitment to you. And two years later, we got married out in DC and we both moved back to Los Angeles. So I started, that's when I came back in 2014. So I had some experience prior to 2015, 2016 with the videos, you know, and, and how you can do this online and still have a real personal interaction because I wanted to be in the office, you know, I'm kind of the type of person that doesn't like to be remote, you know, out of my home. It can get very isolating. Of course, everyone's experiencing that right now, yes. but I had a lot of experience with it from that perspective. If somebody looked at you and said, well, I kind of want to do what Mark does, they might be thinking, you know, why doesn't Mark use, you know, Skype? And then you and I yeah. talked about this, and we'll get to this in a bit, I guess, your choice of technology and why you feel that it works so well. But um, mm -hmm. so, but you, you're, you're coming at this from a couple of angles. So you do this, the buddy insurance thing where you're, you're consulting with people, but then you have also developed your outreach where you're providing a lot of free information and good value to people, you know, with, with no obligation back, a lot of, you know, the right. channels that you do. Right. And, and, but that also leads people to come back to you and say, well, let me check out what Mark's doing. Maybe he can help me. Yeah. But talk about the whole, uh, you know, the payoff of, because I think a lot of people might say, well, if I start doing these videos or I start a blog or I start any kind of, of, of outreach program, you know, how, how do I measure how I get paid back on that work? Yeah. It's, so it's not question. immediate and it's not, it's not definite. So to talk, talk us through yeah. your process of, of how you put together all these different channels for yeah. you know, different different video channels you have, et cetera, the LinkedIn stuff, and and how you expected that to come back to you after you did it. That yeah, I mean, you, you make a good point because marketing, very hard to determine your ROI. 
on your efforts. A lot of it's a branding exercise versus generating actual business. And you have to be able to distinguish, you know, how you're spending your time there. So you have to enjoy it. That's the first thing to understand. If you don't enjoy marketing, you're not going to do it. You're not going to be willing to put in the time and the effort to be effective at it. And people can tell when they see you that, you know, it's, it's not something you're passionate about. So mm -hmm. for me, again, another, there's a lot of components to it. Um, one is that you have to find a platform where you can get visibility. Okay. The two is that um, I always believed in free education. I don't believe that people should have to pay for, for knowledge. You know, you should be, you should be paid for your time. And so when I'm doing things, um, I try to almost always do things that involve educating or learning for free. I also believe that that's a great marketing philosophy because at the end of the day, if you put up paywalls, you limit your audience. And so you need a platform, but you also need to be able to be willing to share as much as you can so that as many people can get to know you and see you as possible. Because at the end of the day, if they want to work with you, uh, first of all, they have to know who you are, but if you're giving them free information, they're much more likely to be wanting to work with you at the end of the day anyway. And so I never think of it as what's the payoff back to me of working with somebody. I think of it kind of, I guess, similarly, but it more in terms of, um, do I want to work with this person? Do they share the same philosophy that I have? I'm a big fan of uh, a consultative uh, sales approach and, you know, customized you know, solutions in complex areas like long-term care insurance, where I feel like specialists tend to be getting the best solution for their clients and they tend to be the most effective. Mm -hmm. And so if I see that kind of person out there, I'm going to want to interview them just to get to know them better. Cause I think they're going to be a good fit for what I'm doing and whether or not they work with me, I'm going to learn a lot from, from engaging with that person. Mm -hmm. um, I do video interviews as you know, like you're doing here with me, um, for fun, because I enjoy meeting people like that, you know, that are unselfish, you know, client focused, um, learning their actual what they're good at, because I, I learned myself, you know, from from what they're doing. And then, you know, when I put them out in terms of my audience, you know, that, that we've grown, like through LinkedIn, for example, um, it's just content that I can actually put out there that's easy for me to produce. So like this interview style, it makes it very easy for me to put it out there. So when you put all the things together, I'm not putting as much time or pain into the marketing because I'm enjoying it and I'm using the content. And then I found all these other benefits to doing it as well. Like kind of like what you said is um, when I do a video with someone, a lot of times they're nervous being on camera for the first time. And so by the end of the video, once we hit the stop button on the recording, they get very relieved. And I can kind of see that they're getting like, they're having the adrenaline endorphins pumping through their system. Mm -hmm. And they're actually, um, I kind of feel a little guilty about it sometimes, but they're actually much more willing to talk to me about what I'm doing. Like they want to give back to me because they feel like so relieved and so happy that they finished this project and they're, they're happy that they're going to, you know, be promoted that way, you know, on, the, mm -hmm. on LinkedIn and things like that. So it ends up leading to a more productive business conversation anyway. And so the way I think of it is if I'm going to spend a half an hour, an hour with a person anyway, might as well do it and create some content at the same time <laughs> that we can, yeah. help use. you know, it's, a, it's, a, I'm an efficiency geek too. You know, I, I love systems and technology because it makes us more efficient and productive with our time. So right. a lot of things are kind of, you know, melding together there. I probably was a, a long answer to a simple question, but. Well, the people that are interested in, in doing this, they want, they, I think they want the long answer. It's like, Oh, you know, yeah. Again, what you're saying is you're not doing a teaser for like some paid videos. So like you drop a couple of tidbits yeah. here and then, and then I'm going to drop a, a bomb at the end and say, well, if you pay $20, you can see Mark's whole interview or some, something right. like that. But you mentioned, you know, specialization. And that was one of the things I was going to ask you. I mean, you developed a bit of a, of a niche in long-term care knowledge. And then you're marketing for buddy insurance is helping agents kind of market long-term care. Do you feel that, uh, especially with the online stuff, that having a focus, it makes a big difference? I mean, I know there's a few generalists that pull off things. Maybe they're famous personalities. Maybe their niche is their personality. Uh, but do you feel like having that focus is a big difference in, in what's helped yeah. you kind of get to where you are so far? I think it's important to have a focus and to have a particular differentiator. That's the key. You know, some of it can be your personality, obviously. Like you said, you could be a generalist. But uh, the more specialized you are, the more people will remember you for a particular thing that you do. And when they need it, you'll be the person that they go to. And so I think having both unique um, 
niche or niche 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 or <laughs> it's uh, niche. I corrected myself in the last couple of months with that. I, I yeah. do know French, so it's terrible. But anyway, <laughs> so having the niche and having the the content spin, having and they, I read in this book, it's kind of a they call it a content tilt. Meaning that if you someone's searching for you, you want to have something about that content that's differentiated from other people out there. If it's just the same as what everyone else is doing, you're not going to stand out from the crowd. And so that's those are the two things that I kind of focus on. That's why I do the videos in, in a certain format that's kind of unique to how I set it up. And when people see it, they know it's Buddy INS. They know it's our format. And it's going to appeal to a particular audience that kind of likes, you know, short interviews and, and free content like that. Mm. So yeah, I think it I think it's really important. It doesn't matter what you're doing, as long as you're doing something that people ultimately get value out of and they see you as the person that's the expert or provider of that resource, that's how you can grow your audience. Um, the other thing that I think is important, and, and there's a book I'm reading called Content Inc. Um, uh, that a friend of mine had told me, actually one of the guests on the show had actually told me about, see how I use what I've learned you know, to improve what I'm doing. And it talks about that you don't even have to sell something. The most important thing today's world is to build an audience. Because mm. uh, at the end of the day, if you build an audience and they trust you and they follow you, then you will find a way to do business you know, with that audience at some point in the future by offering them something of value. And the best way to figure that out is to actually listen to your audience and see what they're asking you for time and time again related to your subject matter expertise. Mm. Uh, and so that, that's kind of how we're building our, our system, our model is first we're trying to grow an audience both in terms of financial professionals, business to business, you know, and that's our LinkedIn channel, but also to their relationships and the consumers. We're trying to build an audience for them. Once you have a very large audience and you have a platform, then all of a sudden you can start to figure out what, what are the types of services that they are looking for and, you know, apply your expertise to a business model. Talk, talk more about that now, to yeah. how you go from the original channel to adding channels, but how they all kind of focused around your niche yeah. and theme. So, you know, buddy insurance to the LinkedIn stuff, to the multiple, you mentioned the actuary channel earlier to me that you had the other one. How do you decide to, so first off, you started off, yeah. how do you decide to add a channel and how do they, do they interact with each other in some way? Yeah, so I would say focus on starting off with one channel and understand how you grow an audience in that channel. So my original channel was actually LinkedIn, meaning that when I was marketing to the Fortune 500 company executives, the very first thing that I did was I connected with all of them on LinkedIn. And probably the majority of them had no idea who I was. And they probably declined my invite the first time. And you have to be careful about how you do it to follow LinkedIn's terms and conditions and things like that. But over time, I probably invited them three, four, five, six times. And eventually they accepted. And it was like, that's strange. They rejected me a bunch of times probably in the past. Why did they accept now? Well, it's because they recognized me. It may have just been because of my prior invites. They saw my picture. They saw it again. They saw it again. They must be like, I must know this guy. There's some reason why he's, he's doing this. Well, I didn't know. They accepted. And it was kind of like, um, I call it the LinkedIn game. It was something that I did. It's, it was time consuming. But, you know, my kids at that time were just being born. And I had the midnight to 4 a.m. shift. So there's a lot to do between midnight and 4 a.m. You know, when your, your spouse is asleep next to you besides going on LinkedIn and you know, seeing who people are and connecting with people. So I was doing it kind of for fun uh, out of sleep deprivation a little bit. But, uh, but uh, once they accepted, I was kind of like, it was kind of like collecting baseball cards, you know, when, when you're youth, you know, like, oh, wow, I have the CEO of this, you know, really top insurance company who's connected with me. That's kind of cool. Well, I later on, I would go to conferences. Okay. And these people would be at the conferences, you know, just circulating around. Of course, they don't know, they wouldn't know who I was, right? Well, Surprise, surprise, I walk up and they say, hey, Mark, what's going on? Like, they knew my name. I was like, how does this person know me? Well, because I was posting on LinkedIn and we were now connected, they were logging in occasionally to look up other professionals, mm -hmm. probably, things like that. They would see my posts. And the more people you're connected to, the more people see your activity level. So I, I started to learn how LinkedIn worked. You know, this is, you know, five, six, seven years ago when I, I really started doing this. And uh, so I ended up connecting to a lot of people through that way and i'm sure there's more efficient ways to do it but for me it was also reading their profiles learning the marketplace understanding who they were and who they were connected to and so i was doing it like market research a little bit mm. as much as yeah, and networking and then through that process i ended up maxing out the number of linkedin connections you can actually have you don't know it at the time but eventually you hit a cap and there's thirty thousand people in my network 
all people that I kind of handpicked to connect with though, because I would always think of like, does this person want to do business with me maybe a year or two from now? Will this person want to know who I am? Like, do I matter to them? That was always what I would think when I would connect with someone. Like if I'm not relevant to them, maybe I, I wouldn't connect with them. But if, if I had some relationship, um, then I would try to connect. So I built a LinkedIn network kind of from scratch that way, but that became my platform because now I actually did have a lot of an audience. And then through that process, um, I ended up finding uh, this, there's a pilot group in LinkedIn where they're testing out new features. And so I managed to get invited into a pilot group, partly because of the network that I have, partly just connecting to the right people and, you know, trying to find, uh, you know, how to participate. And the pilot group that I'm in allows me to do a subscription newsletter uh, on LinkedIn. And what that means is that people can subscribe. So I ran out of connections I could have, which is kind of annoying in a lot of ways. But what I could do instead was encourage them to subscribe to my content that way instead. And then LinkedIn started promoting that and started pushing it out and people outside of my network would start to just subscribe. And so just like any platform you use, you have to figure out like the game, you know, how, how do people get you know, visibility on that platform? How do people get subscribers? So I figured out LinkedIn, like what worked in terms of getting some visibility and subscribers on there. And my, my model at that time, and still is business to business. And so it turned out that that was a good fit. Mm -hmm. Okay, coming back to your original question, I, for anybody out there wanting to do something like this is find your platform. It could be Facebook, it could be YouTube, it could be something else. I also use email marketing as well, and it could just be an email list, right? Most mm -hmm. people have an email list. But you have to collect that and have some systematic process for staying in touch with those people, putting content out there that they actually care about and want to see and not spamming or annoying your audience. And I'm always thinking about how do I give knowledge, give information away, and eventually you'll start to build a following because of that. And so that's that's kind of the, the formula. For yeah, I had a question. So those early days when you had were building your network, what were you? So you're, you're, you were doing B2B, you were trying to build... Uh, was when you were building the LinkedIn uh, connections, was this for buddy insurance or was this for the long-term care um, out to the general agencies marketing? What was the original intention of the? Uh, the original the intention was to get the uh, executives of the insurance companies to, to meet with them, to get to know who I was because we were trying to launch a new long-term care product. So you're and talking then, about the insurance, the, the insurance companies that actually make the product like mass mutual. That actually made, that actually, exactly. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we're talking about, you know, all the name companies that, okay. that you see commercials for. But what yeah. were you sending? What were you curating in these early days to what type of stuff did you find that the executives, uh, you know, were reading that you put out there that wasn't, uh, wasn't putting them off, wasn't making them feel like uh, this guy's annoying me? Well, I had um, experience on the actuarial side with long-term mm -hmm. care. It's kind of a niche expertise you know, okay. uh, even within the actuarial So community. some real like data stuff, like stuff that because that their expertise, they would know it was a little bit of left brain stuff, but you know, yeah. they, that's what they needed because they're building products. These are, these aren't just regular consumers. You want to get yeah. them back to that level. And you, and you have to think about it when you're talking to companies and trying to convince them to offer products, you have to understand the business side of it. You have to understand how are they gonna make a profit from these products? How do they know it's safe to offer those products? I know consumers will want to buy those products. You know, just any kind of business has to think through those things. So I understood kind of the mentality of an insurance company executive when making a decision about offering a new product. What are their fears? What are their desires with that thing? And so mm -hmm. I would, I would, you know, give information about long-term care specifically, and I knew that would be of interest to those types of individuals because I talk to them all the time, right? You know, you think about, you know, what you're talking to your clients about all the time. It, that is the expertise that you can provide. And so being able to be in that role in business development, you know, to try to convince them to offer a new product, I need to understand what their you know, concerns were. And I started publishing some of that information in trade magazines anyway. I started writing articles about why is long-term care safe to offer? Because we didn't have as much of a demand issue. There's a lot of misconceptions about long-term care insurance and why people you know, are afraid uh, to buy it or agents are afraid to offer it but there was actually more of an issue on the supply side mm. where there weren't as many companies willing to offer it because they've lost money on the product in the past. Maybe some of the companies in the past made bad decisions or underpriced products. Mm. And so I had to come back out and say, well, today things are different, but you can't just say that. Everyone can say uh, things are different now. You actually have to offer some kind of fundamental reason why it is different. And so analyzing the fundamentals, 
I would share in articles, you know, here, here's what's really going on. And then they would get published in trade magazines. Well, that also became my content, you know, for LinkedIn and mm. information that I could provide that would be of value to them because they're constantly doing market research. Every insurance company wants to have long-term care solutions. It's such a big problem in society that insurance is very uniquely equipped to deal with. And so they wanted to be in the market, but they were afraid of the market. And so how do you, you kind of bridge that gap? That, that was the kind of information that, you know, I would often post, but not all left brain, you know, a lot of it's just, you know, uh, reaching out to people and giving short messages and, and, you know, tidbits about what's going on in the world today, you know, updates as to, you know, different uh, market market things that are going on, for example, mm -hmm. all of that's interesting too. So there's a lot of different types of content you can do that are not purely academic or technical in nature that can add value, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And that's everyone's marketing, by the way, that's not unique to insurance at all or long-term care is a lot of times like COVID, for example, right? What's going on right now? Um, you can do an article about, and I did, I did a video recently about how COVID is affecting the insurance industry, you know? So you can play off of what's going on, use your expertise to help people out there understand, you know, the world and it's relevant to, you know, your audience that way. Um, but like you said, you, you weren't just giving them these kind of emotional, oh, everybody needs insurance like that. That's like a TV commercial for like, you know, yeah. during the Super Bowl. That's not talking to an executive, an insurance company it's, that is just like knows how to tune all of that out. But you've got to give them something yeah. that is that really, um, really yeah. hits them. It's the, maybe data, maybe something they didn't know about in the marketplace. Yeah, I would say the preconceived notion they had that you're changing. You know? Yeah, it all kind of boils down to understanding your audience. Mm. And that's what marketing is all about. Understanding what channel you're promoting it in or you're discussing things in and, and mm. understanding your audience. So I understood, yeah, they're short on time, right? The audience that I'm reaching out to, these executives are very busy. Um, they, they need credible information. And you're not trying to sell something to somebody. You're just trying to share your expertise. So if you follow the kind of those tenets, so to speak, you know, again, your, your audience will, will show you that they appreciate what you're doing. And you should also analyze um, the metrics that one of the nice things about social media and different internet platforms is they actually provide you view counts on what you're doing. People yeah. are commenting and liking your posts, right? So it's a little bit of a game like to figure out, okay, how do I maximize my viewership? But that's also a, a, a metric and indication that people are interested in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. If they weren't, then you wouldn't see as much you know interaction with your content yeah uh, and and i'll point out one more thing which is this is a marketing exercise that's more branding uh when you're on social media like that because a lot of people they, they build this audience and they'll be like why isn't anybody coming to me and asking me for my services and the answer <laughs> to that is that's not the purpose of it that's not would you go out and ask somebody else you saw on linkedin for their services generally not okay so think about how you would react uh, the, the main thing, though, is that remember when I said, you know, I go to conferences, people would recognize me. That's the branding aspect of it, which mm -hmm. means that when you do reach out, which is usually in social media land and like a direct message to them on the platform, the key thing is they respond and they respond in a warm way right. because they know who you are and what you're about. You're not just one of those spammers that you, that you said it just connects with everybody and tries to sell somebody like something the first time they meet them. Right. And so as long as you, you know, reach out and you're having a meaningful conversation with them, that's how you start to really build a relationship. Mm. And so that's the other aspect of our marketing and what we do with Buddy INS too is um, we don't do like just mass marketing and, and blast emails and these kind of things. We actually have technology that outreaches to people in a very personal way, like direct emails to them, you know, with, with questions that are relevant to what they're going through that may be of interest to them. And therefore, you see your response rates are a lot higher that way, too. Yeah, you brought up a good point, Sid, by personalizing it. You went to conferences, people recognized you, but also in any field, whether you're a, a coach, a consultant, or something, you have connections on LinkedIn, they're familiar with you. If you're also, say, working the referral market in that particular industry, and then you, you know, and then your client, Jim, refers you to, you know, Susie, who's also the same kind of your I ideal client, whatever that is, you could actually reach out to them on LinkedIn and mention the name and all of a sudden they're going to put two connections together with you and it may have more impact. Let's start off with adding another channel. Uh, how do you do that? How do you decide? So say, first of all, you should decide whether you actually want to add another channel. It's okay. really important to think about your channels in terms of what 
what where is your audience where's their playground where are they interacting like people go to conferences you know in person that's a good channel for them because they know that their target audience might be there right mm. you should think of the online channels the same way uh, i go on linkedin because you know a lot of what i do is business to business working with other people's clients so to speak mm. and so in order to meet those business relationships that makes a lot of sense to me your client facing though your clients are not let's say business owners maybe they'll be more inclined to be on facebook um, for example, if you're going to decide to go to Pinterest or Instagram, which I'm not personally active on, it's because mm -hmm. the people that I connect with aren't active on that channel. That's not mm -hmm. where they are. And so the first thing you should decide with your channel is where is your audience? Um, and so I would say it's not important to actually go to multiple channels. I would say it's more important to focus on one channel that really you can master and you can be the person that that's kind of uh, an influencer in that arena. So I only use really two main channels right now, which is LinkedIn and email. Um, and that's because that's where my audience spends the most time. Mm. Um, I, you know, for, for B2B to C, you know, when you're going to the consumer level, we'll probably end up, we have a, a Facebook group we, we're starting off and we'll probably end up developing that because now we're connecting with the consumer more so. And when pe people interact with us, of course, it's important to keep that relationship going. And so of course we'll have a way for them to, follow, subscribe to the Facebook group or the Facebook channel, and then we can start to build uh, you know, an audience there where they might actually see us. But that, I, I think that answers your question, which is, mm -hmm. I would say don't, your, your first inclination probably should be don't expand to different channels until you actually master one of them. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not getting traction in one channel, you're not gonna have better traction across multiple channels anyway. So for some people that might be a mental cop-out, and what you're saying is that, hey gosh, you know, you didn't master this one channel. It's it's not me. It's the channel. And let me go. Right. Wait, maybe I need to like you know dig a little dive a little deeper here. So that's a, that's a great point. I mean, you yeah. you it's you got to look and find out what the root cause is of of the results you're getting. Yeah, and try different things. If it's not working, what I tell people: if something's not working, try something different because it's probably going to continue to not work. And research. Go on Google. Research. You know, how do I get more visibility on LinkedIn? And there are people like myself who are giving away information for the same motivation is that they want to build an audience and they're actually giving out good information. So virtually everything that I've learned myself, I haven't just all learned the hard way. I've researched and seen what are other people doing. And that's probably a good segue into your technology question too, because I would say the same thing for technology is don't learn it the hard way. Just do some internet searching, see what people are recommending. There's good platforms that are reviewing different technologies and software. And that's what I'm using as the first filter to figure out, do I want to spend my time trying to learn whatever it is that I'm trying to do in terms of the technology aspect. Mm. And you and I just talked about, for example, technology, Zoom, which is very hot right now for yeah. good and bad reasons. It was a great solution <laughs> for people. And now there's supposedly because of servers in China. But for us talking, I mean, what would we care if somebody decided to break into our video stream and run naked across the screen. It might entertain a few people, you know? I imagine for high level stuff, you, you go to Microsoft or something like that where you know this yeah. is secure, or you go to GoToMeeting where they have, or Citrix you know, has, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, SEC grade security on, on their stuff. But, but, you know, Zoom was very easy to use. I had the software, you and I tried uh, Google Meet first, and there was a little bit of, uh, of a drag in the, uh, in the video for whatever reason, we don't know. We tried the Zoom, it's been working perfect. So it's one of those things where if it just works, easy to record, easy to talk, yeah. free, you know, 40 minutes free. So you, I mean, I think you and I kind of figured that out. Saying, uh, the technology that you use is really unique to your process. Mm. And remember, it's not always, it's not just about the technology, it's about something fundamental you're trying to accomplish with it. So for me, video is really important because I'm meeting with people around the country and I want to have a real engagement in a face-to-face -face meeting. So I try to do every meeting with the camera because it leads to a more meaningful interaction. Okay? <laughs> and, and so understanding what you're trying to accomplish, of course, that kind of leads you maybe in the right direction about whether this technology is important enough to you. Because you can also spend a lot of money on technology that you really don't get a lot out of. Mm. Um, so first you have to kind of understand your process, you know, which can be challenging in itself. And for me, the process started off with, how do I have a virtual meetings with people? Cause I'm meeting with them every day. How do I make sure that they're getting booked in the right way? So I use a software Calendly that a lot of people are probably familiar with mm. to basically be my virtual assistant in allowing people to book my calendar. In fact, you booked this meeting. You didn't even 
you didn't even be like, hey, Mark, when are we going to meet? You literally just grabbed my link and you booked a time like two mm -hmm. weeks ago and all of a sudden it's there and, and we're set and I don't have to even think about it. So it's a productivity thing from the meeting perspective. And then understanding how I was using the videos are important. Most people I would suggest they probably shouldn't buy a lot of equipment, you know, for video purposes, unless they're planning to do a lot of video meetings or and or recordings as mm -hmm. part of their marketing. And so when I realized that that was something I was going to do for Buddy INS, where I'm interviewing a lot of people, that's when I said I need to make an investment in this area, the technology area, uh, because I'm going to be using it a lot. I'm going to get a good ROI for what I'm going to spend. And the technology is inexpensive enough now. Or if you're using it a lot, you should definitely spend the time to figure it out. And what, what was the first thing that I did? As I mentioned to you, I did some research. I went on YouTube. And guess who is popular on YouTube? There's people that literally have professional YouTube channels they make money from advertisements and millions of followers you know what they also do they do videos about how do i do my videos and they share <laughs> their equipment with you just like what we're talking about here yeah. i went on there and I, I learned what equipment they were using i made some notes i said okay the most important thing i learned from that is you need a good microphone the audio quality people being able to hear you well is number one. Second most important thing is the video quality people being able to see you well is number two the third thing is other things that enhance that process, which is lighting. So I actually have lighting in here. You can see I'm kind of brighter on the screen because I have lighting that I purchased. And I figured out what was inexpensive, had good Amazon reviews that I could buy, tried out a few different things. I bought like eight or nine different pieces of equipment, so to speak, but everything in total was under like 200 bucks. You know, it's mm. not that expensive. And so, and if anybody in your audience wants to know about it, I have like a, an email that I send to people that want to know. I have all the links to everything I bought so they can just click on the links and buy it off the shelf. Now a lot of it's out of stock because of COVID. <laughs> a lot of the video stuff. Everybody's doing but, this. <laughs> yeah, but you know, but you can still buy things, you know, off of my list of links, and I'm happy to share it. Um, but you know, it, it took you know some time to do that. And again, if I can save someone else time from having to go through that same learning curve, I'm happy to do it. That's one component of probably about 20 different pieces of software that we use in terms of our whole. I call it our tech stack. You know, all mm -hmm. of our marketing technology put together. Um, and they all have a particular purpose to them for what we do every day in our business. And they're all in relatively inexpensive. So, you know, we can justify the ROI we're getting on getting, you know, having a service. A lot of them are subscription services that charge you every month. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, that technology has gotten less expensive. And so, uh, and a lot of them just allow you to go month to month or do a free trial. And I would say, if you're going to use something a lot, don't be afraid to experiment and try it out. And you're going to have to spend a little bit of time to try to figure it out, but you are going to thank yourself later if you end up, it ends up becoming a major component of what you do every day. And it's going to save you, you know, multiples of the time in the future. You know, that's what technology is supposed to do. So yeah, I'm happy to share our whole tech stack with you. Uh, we probably don't have enough time on the call to go through everything, but. Uh, well, I was going to actually, what I'm going to yeah. do is I'll ask you for um, how do people contact you? I'll ask you a couple of geeky questions. One was this Calend Calendly uh, integrate with Zoom because when you schedule a meeting with you, it automatically gives me a Zoom link. So those two kind of, that, that's a time saver, right? There's yes. no two-stepper there. It automatically says, here's the Zoom link for the meeting. Yes, and, and out of all the 20 pieces of technology yeah. in our tech stack that I was mentioning, that's, yeah, that's the, really the key to it is understanding also how they integrate to each other. Yeah. Um, so yeah, everything kind of ties. The first step of our process ties to the second step, to the third step, to the fourth step, to our CRM in terms of how we track people, to our marketing system. Uh, the more ties you have with those integrations that are seamless and the less you know manual clicks or manual processes you have, of course, the more time you're going to save. And the more seamless your experience is you know, as the professional, but also your client's experience is. And so we're a marketing tech company from a perspective of we're trying to really enhance the client experience for all of our partners. At the end of the day. Interesting. I don't know if I'm getting beeps because we're getting near the end of the time, but I would say is uh, last question I would hit you with for technology purpose. Then we'll say, is there, is there a, a CRM that is works good with social, social marketing that you do? Um, you know, LinkedIn is, is very, uh, uh, particular about what connects to their platform. And so okay. it's limited the interaction you can do with LinkedIn. There's good ones with Facebook and, and some other ones, but we yeah. don't directly do social connections uh, to the CRM, but most of the people I'm connected to, I have their email and I, and I have a relationship with them. So we kind of put them in that way. Oh, great. Good. So 
the ways to get a hold of you, uh, Mark, people want to talk with you. Uh, Mark at Buddy and BuddyINS.com is your direct email. Yep. Uh, BuddyINS.com is the website that kind of yep. you know, the hub for everything right now. They can find Mark Glickman on LinkedIn. I'm going to put, uh, obviously, these links in the video. But mm -hmm. any other ways that you feel people should want to get a hold of you or, or connected with you, is there anything else that you would suggest? Yeah, LinkedIn's the number one thing. Once you're connecting me on LinkedIn, uh, you'll be able to see what I'm up to. We'll be able to interact through messaging on there. And uh, I use their messaging platform quite a bit uh, on there. So yeah, if you want to learn more, just connect with me on LinkedIn. Just send a message about, you know, if you saw the video with Chris uh, and I'll accept you and then we'll, we'll kind of begin from there. So that's the best way. Awesome. Well, this is great, Mark. I mean, this was a really good rundown of going from old school to new school and everything in between. And uh, and if, if people, like I said, Mark just uh, gave you, we just gave you his contact info. We'll put it below if you want to learn more about what he's doing. But you get an idea here. If you are look, so tired of the corporate life a bit and you want to, you know, have uh, work out of your uh, home library with the kids running around in the background, you can do that too. And, um, but Mark, so much appreciate your time tremendously here. I think this is going to be helpful to a lot of people. So thank you so much for taking the time to do this today. Happy to be on the show, Chris. Thanks for inviting me. Awesome. Well, I'll let you go and we'll connect soon, but uh, have yourself a great day and stay safe. And I think it looks like, you know, with all the good news coming out, we'll be out, hopefully out within a month or so back to our uh, usual stuff. But for you and I, it's, uh, I don't think much has changed over the last month. So keep up the good work. I appreciate it. Stay safe, everyone. Thanks, Mike. Talk to you soon.